uh, like thank you, Sadiq, and thank you to the MLOps community for hosting us. Uh, I'm Hamza Tahir, I'm one of the co-founders of ZenML, and I'm going to be talking about tool agnostic MLOps. So uh, I would be um, like remiss not to talk about ZenML and who we are. Um, ZenML is a team spread out across the world. We are, four of us are here today, Adam, Rosie, and Michael. So if you want to talk about ZenML, talk to them. Uh, about if you have any questions, or of course, after this talk. And uh, we're now 12 people strong. We're a startup based in primarily Munich. Um, so we have our headquarters here. But we, uh, yeah, day to day, we're just building ZenML and putting forward the principles that, that I'm going to be talking about today. Right, getting into the talk. So uh, yeah, I mean, this is a bit funnier now that Elon has taken over Twitter. Hello. But uh, yeah, machine learning engineering, of course, as Chip says, is is really a small amount of machine learning and a large amount of engineering. I'm preaching to the choir. Everybody knows that already. Um, but I like to show this because if there are some data scientists in this room, uh, which usually there aren't in these meetups, what, what they usually see in machine learning is something like this. Uh, but what engineers see is something like this, <laughs> which is which is maybe not the best way uh, for us to start a day. But uh, I don't want to alienate the data scientists. It is a quite quite a complicated process because essentially we are in a very complex MLOps landscape right now. I think everybody understands that machine learning tooling has evolved quite drastically and machine learning operationalization tooling even more so. And uh, the training part is just that small center. And we have a lot more stuff going on around it. And that's that's why we're 10,000 people in the Slack channel, just to figure that out. So it, it can be quite overwhelming, right? So uh, there's a lot to handle uh, from anything from distributed data processing to A-B testing, which is a bit easier now, uh, but, uh, but still, still, still quite complicated in practice. And really, you know, like when you think about it, uh, a standardized MLOps workflow seems quite straightforward, right? Like you have data collection, uh, which is quite, quite easy nowadays. Training the model one line, uh, unless it's like GPT-4. And deployment and production, which is also quite easy. As you saw, Sadiq did this uh, with, with A-B testing in a few seconds, basically. Um, and I think what makes this quite complicated, right, is the fact that it's not a linear flow. So Software engineering is also not linear. It is like there is a loop uh, which we covered through CI/CD. But the thing with software engineering is that the thing that loops back is usually code, right? So if you have a web application, or if you have a mobile application, if you want to add a button, or if you want to add like a color change to your CSS files, all you really have to do is go back and change the code, right? In machine learning, it's a bit more difficult. You have you have not only code that flows back, but you have these like data loops that are very hard to manage. And I really think that's the difference between the complexity that arises from machine learning operationalization as opposed to software engineering operationalization. Um, so it's essentially what we're doing is we're trying to control that data through a set of practices that are yet to be defined. Um, and hopefully we will be part of the people who actually define these principles. So yeah, um, that's, that's really what makes it complicated. In, in practice, if you build an MLOps pipeline or a workflow, you, you will see that there's many different tools, right? So it's, it's very complicated to go from collection of the data, the training it, to tracking the experiments, to deploying it, and looping back. So there's many, many components in an MLOps pipeline, which makes it quite hard. Um, so what if you want to choose the right MLOps tools, right? What if you want to, what if you want to pick the best for your use case, for your context, and you don't want to necessarily commit to it, you just want to date it, let's say, so to speak, right? So you just want to see how it is. Um, so there are tools which offer more advantages than other tools right now. So you have, uh, this is just an example from our docs, um, deep checks, evidently great expectations. These are all so-called data validation tools. They help you validate your data. 
and they offer different qualities, right? So you have drift detection that evidently is really good at, profiling, which great expectations is good at, and quality measurement, which DeepJex is good at. And DeepJex also happens to work with Torch and computer vision, which can be quite useful. So if you're going to build a standard flow, it can be quite hard to capture all these tools if you have different teams or if, even if you have different projects that require different things. Um, because it does have a high cost of experimentation, right? So I think every one of you has been there. Hey, found out about a tool on a great meetup. Go back to the office, try out a POC, try to convince the managers, try to convince other people. So there's, there's a bit of high cost uh, of experimentation. Uh, I can see some people already done this. Um, so, you know, like code development can be quite paralyzed if you have a tool which is fixed. And this acts as a blocker for other teams. Um, and you can just have FOMO, right? Uh, you, can just, you can just say, okay, well, well, why is the other company using great expectations when I, when I'm very still stuck with, uh, I shouldn't say another tool, this is being recorded, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Some other tool, uh, like uh, inbuilt data validation tool. Kubernetes, yes. <laughs> it was pretty easy in that demo, though. Yeah. So, um, so, I mean, this is the focus of the talk. Um, and this is the part of ZenML that I'm going to be focusing on. Um, ZenML does do other things, but one thing that it does very well is that it acts as an extensible open source framework layer um, that separates your code from your MLOps tooling stack. So essentially, tries not to make any assumptions about what sort of tooling stack you're going to be using when you develop machine learning workflows, machine learning pipelines. How does it do that? Well, the first thing it allows you to do is it allows you to author portable machine learning pipelines. Um, these pipelines are just Python functions. The Python functions, you just like decorate it with the add step decorator, and you have a pipeline which you decorate with add pipeline, just like here. And then, in that pipeline, you just write normal Python code. Um, and then outside of that pipeline, you actually define your stack. So your stack can be like, OK, what experiment tracker am I using? What data validator tool am I using? What uh, orchestrator am I using? These things, you don't need to know exactly what everything does. But essentially, we've come up with these abstractions across the pipeline that lets you make or postpone the decision of what tool you want to use. Um, and lets you then transport your machine learning workflows from a simple stack to maybe a more complicated stack. And this is not just important in terms of, uh, how to say it, like um, if you have different tools, it can also be important if you have different environments. So if you have a, if you want to transition from local to the cloud, right? If you want to go from your machine and you don't want to change your code, but you want to deploy it to a Kubeflow cluster or on, on, on Kubernetes. Or if you want to go to Airflow, um, you don't necessarily want to transfer or transform your code into Airflow DAGs or Kubeflow DAGs um, and so forth. So, so it's very useful to think of machine learning disconnected from the actual stack. Any questions so far? We can also do them at the end. So let me give you a concrete example of this, a very trivial one, but something which is very useful to understand what I'm talking about. So let's say you don't have a ZenML and you write a pipeline. Um, let's say it's in Airflow. So what you can do is you can get your data and then you can have like a factory or something which instantiates an object that then uploads that artifact to some artifact store. This is a very normal pattern, right? You have to, you can't just, forget about your data, you need to upload it somewhere and download it. Um, so if you want to change the actual pipeline, you need to change S3 and Azure and all those things in your code when you want to switch. And there's a lot of complexity around that. This is still a nicely formatted function where you have upload artifacts and get artifacts. But essentially, you still have to standardize a lot of things around the artifacts and so forth. With ZenML, what you do is you define your pipeline the pipeline can be returning a data frame, right? And in this data frame, you can get it in the next step. But And you don't need to actually define how the data is materialized. So you don't need to 
say, okay, how is my data frame persisted? Is it in by arrow files? Is it in in a in Parkway? Is it in a database? You don't need to really understand that, or even make an assumption about whether it's S3 or local storage. And all you need to do is register the artifact store on your CLI or on your dashboard, and then set it to be active. So you can say, okay, I want to today use S3 as my persistence layer with this bucket then, or I want to use my Azure container um, and update my stack or create a new stack, which does that. So you can run the same pipeline, which persists the data layer across you know, whatever pipeline you want, and that turns out to be very powerful. That's just one example, but this really does prove very useful in many other contexts across the abstractions that I talked about. Right. Let's go to a demo then. So I might also be quicker today than I imagine, but uh, I'm just going to show you how this actually works in practice. Okay, I, I, it's too complicated to talk in the mic. <laughs> so I'm just going to put it. <laughs> Kudos to you, Sadik, for doing it, but I, I, I can't. Okay, so here's here's um, what I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to show you uh, a demo which goes from local local pipelines to something which runs in GCP and uses a different data validation stack. And then it goes to AWS and uses a different data validation tool, but it's all the same pipeline, right? So let me show you first the basic case. So the basic case looks like this. You have your pipeline. The pipeline imports some data trains on some machine learning model, evaluates uh, the model, and prints it out, and it's reading local data. So the way this pipeline looks like is very simple. I'm not going to dive so much into the code today, but I think it's important to at least see this part. So you can see I'm using the, uh, the way ZNML defines pipelines is very abstract, so you can plug in your functions when you want. So in this case, I'm using a development data loader. And this development data loader is just loading the iris data set and returning it. That's your step. Then it's training some data using SVC, and then it's evaluating it. And now, if I want to run this, I can just run my Python file. But I need to tell ZenML what stack I'm going to use. right? So I'm going to be using my local stack for the first go, because I'm quickly experimenting. And you can see that. Uh, the one, well, this is a bit hard to read. It says local git flow stack. So this is the local stack. It's using def it's using a, an orchestrator and an artifact store, which is local to me. So these two components are very important for ZenML because this is the minimum components. I mean, you saw there are like 10 different sorts of components, but two things you need to define always in a stack, an orchestrator and an artifact store. An orchestrator tells it, how do I run this pipeline? Where do I run this pipeline? And uh, Artifact Store tells it what I showed you. Where do I persist the results of this pipeline? In my um, local stacks case, I'm going to be persistent, persisting the orchestrator and the Artifact Store in my default local environment. So I'm going to be using the same virtual environment I'm in. There's other things that we don't need to worry about. But for now, you just need to focus on the orchestrator and the Artifact Store. And then I'm just going to run this file. And when I run this file, it's essentially the same as just calling functions and running them in a Python script, um, except that ZenML treats these functions a bit special and understands which stack it needs to work on. So it does a few different things for different stacks. So in this particular case, what it's doing is it's running locally. Um, my computer is a bit laggy. But essentially, it because it runs locally, I ran this pipeline. Uh, like when Sadiq was talking, <laughs> and and uh, and it's using the cached version of of um, of the first step, so it doesn't need to uh, actually um, do anything special because it knows that it, this pipeline has ran before on this particular stack. That's pretty cool. Uh, then you have the trainer, and then you have the evaluator, and at the end you can see that everything runs through. Um, ZenML also comes free with a dashboard. Uh, and this dashboard is going to show me that I just ran a pipeline. 
which looks a bit like this. And if I click on any of the artifacts that flow through this, I can see that this is stored in my local artifact store. And this is now very cool that I can see it. Um, and I can even click on which stack it used. Uh, again, might be a bit overwhelming right now, but most important thing is I'm using a local artifact store and I'm using the um, default orchestrator here. So that was quite easy. So that's the first thing I have to do. Now, what if I want to, let's say, run on GCP? Uh, and I want to run the same pipeline that I had, but I just want to insert a few more steps and introduce data validation. So all I have to do is go to this pipeline here. This pipeline you can see is doing using the same training function and is using the same evaluation function, but it's loading data from uh, a different source. Let's call it a GCP bucket. And it's using my deep checks data validator to, um, to actually validate the data. So I just sort of configured my the same pipeline with two more steps. Now, because I have two more steps, I need more components. So I'm going to see which components I have configured. In this particular case, what, I, what I've added is data validation. And now I don't want to run this locally. I want to run this, on, let's say, on GCP, right? So GCP has this Vertex AI. Uh, like, does everybody, or like, does, like some of you know about Vertex AI? The Jans, a few, a few people. So Vertex AI is like SageMaker pipelines, if you know AWS. It's, it's a managed orchestrator which lets you run workloads like pipelines um, on the cloud. So if I want to use that particular stack, you can see this is the uh, like this is the stack which is defined. Uh, I can even show you in the in the nicer view, which is the UI. And you can see in this particular view, you can see I have a secrets manager, I have an orchestrator, which is Vertex. I, I added the deep checks validator. Deep checks is a tool for data validation, which I'm going to use for this particular demo, and so on and so forth. So let's switch to that stack. And now I'm just going to do XenML stack set. Done. And I'm going to run my staging pipeline. And now XenML will behave slightly differently. So it will actually, rather than running this locally, it will understand that because I'm going to run in the cloud, um, it needs to do something slightly different. It needs to, you know, it can't just run from my local machine in the cloud. What it needs to do is probably build a Docker image. And from that Docker image, extract from my environment all the requirements. And then from those requirements, maybe build the image and push it. And you can see all, all of this is automated for you. You don't need to know anything about it. And push the image to a container registry, which is also something which is a stack component. I, I can actually show you this registry is being used. So this registry will be used to push in this stack. And then after it has done pushing this Docker image, it will deploy the Vertex pipeline with the same code that we saw locally on the cloud. So just to just to see it visually in my in my, in my presentation, you can see what's happening is rather than like rather than using the default orchestrator and default orchestrator, it actually converted the uh, orchestrator to Vertex AI, and now it's persisting everything in a Google Cloud bucket, so not my local. And it's added a few more components which are also deployed on GCP. Now, how the components are deployed in infrastructure, you need to set up once. But after you're done, you can just use the stacks to point to things, different things. So you can see the job has run through. It even gives me some logs. And it tells me that a Vertex AI job has run. So you, indeed, you can see that the Vertex, so this is the Vertex AI dashboard. And you can see that the Vertex AI dashboard is indeed running a pipeline. And this pipeline is doing the same pipeline that I did locally, the same code. Maybe I edited the code. Uh, especially these two functions are the same. And it's going to load different data. And it's going to also validate it with deep checks, right? So, so that's the only change I made. Um, and just using the command line, I could do it. So this might take a bit of time. So I'm just going to take the previous pipeline, this one. And you can see that this pipeline runs through pretty 
pretty okay, right? Uh, everything is green. I can see the logs if I want. Everything you would expect in an orchestrator, like Airflow or Qflow, whatever you're used to. Um, if I go to my dashboard, I can also see a corresponding pipeline here. It's called the staging train and deploy pipeline. This is the one that ran before. And you can see that it's exactly the same pipeline. Uh, right now, the vertex visualization looks a bit better, but we'll get better soon. And you can see that rather than storing the, the, the things in a local environment, in my local machine, the data frame that was returned was, was actually stored in a Google Cloud bucket. And, and it was doing a data validation step, which was producing a report. And we, can, we will see this report in a second. So that's, my, that's one of my stacks. So imagine you have a GitHub Actions or a workflow where when you make a pull request, it actually runs on a different stack and uses staging data. And when you actually merge to production, it runs on a completely different stack. So let's let's talk about the third stack that I was teasing. So I have yet another stack here, which I'm, I'm calling the production stack, which is not using Vertex. It's just running on Kubeflow. Kubeflow, again, maybe I can see a show of hands. How many people are familiar with Kubeflow? Good, almost the same amount. Again, another orchestrator, very popular tool to run machine learning workloads. And I'm just going to switch my stack to Qflow git flow stack. And I can also describe my stack. And you can see that it's basically the same stack as before. The only thing is I've swapped out a few things. So rather than using uh, DCP, I'm using AWS Secrets Manager. I'm using the AWS Container Registry. I'm validating it with evidently. So I'm, I'm using a different tool for validation. And the way my pipeline looks like is pretty much similar. So this is the production pipeline. And here you can see it's the same code. Obviously, in production, you might have different data. The only line change that I've done in the run is I've converted the deep checks data validator to the evidently data validator. That's it. And everything else is the same, except I actually also deploy the model at the end. Um, so like now that my stack has changed, um, I'm just going to have to do Xenomal stack up for a technical reason just to forward the ports because, because I need access to that locally. But after that's done, what I can do is I can just run the same pipeline again. And let's say let's say this happened when you merged to domain, as an example. So when this runs, it will also detect, it's the same code again, but it's just going to detect, ah, OK, now this person doesn't want me to do the GCP stuff. It wants me to do the AWS stuff. So it's it's loading my AWS credentials right now. It's going to build the image in a second. It's going to get the requirements that it needs here. And it's going to push, rather than pushing to GCP, it's going to push to Amazon. And actually, we can see all of this very nicely in this in the presentation again. Sorry for switching so much. I hope it's still understandable. So I just went from this stack to this stack. So change Vertex to Qflow, GCP to S3 bucket, MLflow I haven't talked about today, and I turned deep checks to evidently. And when I did that, I you can see that the container registry is different. And I have Qflow deployed here. So Qflow is, again, as I said, another orchestrator. Uh, this time, we've hosted this on, um, on AWS. And in a second, we'll see that there's a run created with the same code that you said just ran on GCP, but on AWS. There it is. So it just created a Qflow pipeline now. Let's refresh it. And in a second, you see, you see this is the same pipeline, which is running on GCP, now running here. I also ran this before, just to make it faster. You can see here. It does the same thing, but rather than doing deep checks, it's using evidently. And then it's doing evaluating. And then it's actually deploying to KServe. If you guys are interested, you can read the Zenmel docs. We also automate a lot of the demo that uh, Sadik showed you. So you, you can also deploy to Selden from Python rather than writing the YAML files. But anyway, that's another topic of Zenmel. And when you've actually done that, you can see that in my dashboard, 
there will be another pipeline created. So the staging pipeline is still running. Give me a second. You can see this is still running. And the prod pipeline will spin up soon. Let's look at the one which was running before. So this is the same pipeline. And now you can see this is stored in S3. So the artifact store that I specified. Now, that's all well and good. But what if I want to uh, visualize my results, right? What if I want to see actually how did it, did it work? So for that, what I'm going to do is we have these handy visualizers uh, in ZenML built in for all of our integrations because we integrate to so many tools. And I'm going to actually show you the reports that deep checks and evidently in those two runs produced. So um, all I'm doing here is I'm getting my pipeline, fetching it locally. I'm getting the last run or the run before that. I'm getting the step and I'm passing it into a deep checks visualizer. And I'm doing the same with evidently. So let's let's first do the GCP one, which is vertex. And you can see here that, yeah, I'm just calling this function. I'm saying, okay, use this pipeline. And this is the fun, uh, like this is the name of the function which produced the report. And here you can see the exact same report that we saw as a link. It's locally visualized, and you can see that my um, deep checks produced a different sort of report than evidently would. It, it told me that my string length was fine. It told me that my outlier, there were no outliers in my data, st stuff like that, which is important for data profiling. And if I want to run the same, I uh, just need to restart it. And now rather than using the GCP stack, let's use the production stack or the AWS stack and produce produce the result from AWS, which was produced by evidently another tool. And you'll see that it shows you pretty much the same things, but because evidently is a bit different, it will visualize it in different ways and show you different data. So here you can see this is the report. The cool thing about evidently is it also shows you these bar graphs and histograms for your features. So it's pretty much a similar report, but it does different things. As I showed you, the power of having different tools do different things. Right. Okay, that was a lot. Actually, I realized while I was talking. <laughs> but um, uh, I just wanted to give you an impression of what's possible with with ZenML. And if you, oh, this is fine. I'm, I'm ending anyway. <laughs> the people are hungry. So I'll just end here. So if, if you're interested in what you saw today, and if you're interested in tool agnostic MLOps, then please give us a star on GitHub, like Munich-based MLOps startup. So I hope that we get definitely support here. Um, so it's github.com slash cinemal dash io slash cinemal. Our Slack is super active now, uh, more than a thousand or like, like, like closing a thousand people. Uh, you can join that as well and talk to us. And one thing I, I, I want to ask, I, I, I don't know if this is the right crowd, but maybe you know someone. We are looking to make that DAG visualizer a bit better. So if you have a front end developer, working student part time who, um, who you know, then please send them to career at zenimal.io. We are hiring for that position. It's, it's a very hard position to fill somehow, but hopefully with this card, we, we can help. That's it. Nice. Adana, you wanna? Uh, are there any questions? Sorry, go ahead. One question. I understand that you abstract many different things. Yeah. Are there any formal guarantees provided by the framework so that I can still reason about the behavior for, for reproducibility? Yes. Um, so formal guarantees sounds more like SLAs and stuff, right? No, I'm thinking like the logic. Well, the like logically, we have every integration we provide is pinned to a version that we test on, or a range of versions, and we have a testing suite that tests all the different combinations. So it's based on the, you know, the same behavior. Yes, oh. yes. Yeah. So so if you do ZenML integration install, evidently it will install the right environment that suits ZenML. And we rely on the community to update these integrations as you go. Yes. Good. You showed so many tool integrations. So how is telemetry integration? Like to send my app data to, let's say, I don't know, a cluster or whatever, like um, what we saw before for the mm. testing. Mm -hmm. So like a module here as well? Mm -hmm. For monitoring, you mean? For, yeah, monitoring. Yeah. Um, we have, so it's an interesting question. So we have three different ways of doing that. We have the experiment tracker, 
I didn't go into that today, but we have ML flow, for example, if you know. So here you can see the logs while training. That's one sort of monitoring that you might have. Then we have the data validators, which give you the data lineage. And then we have uh, the deployer tools. And the deployment tools like Selden or KServe, they, they actually help you also set up the monitoring part. If you don't run deployment through us, then it's there's less of a need of that sort of abstraction because usually that abstraction lies more in the deployment tools. And so, so let's say you have a pipeline that deploys a model. After that, you wouldn't, if you unless you're running batch inference, if you're running real-time predictions, you might just want to ping that model directly. So, um, so it's a bit hard to um, hook into that in, with an abstraction. Having said that. We have heard that before that you need a monitoring abstraction. Um, yeah, we, we we just need to uh, like like win our battles. It's such a huge space, so we we've, we've stopped at deployment and data validation. Maybe in a few months we expand our our scope also to monitoring. Okay. Um, I'm wondering how fast is your release cycle to integrate the newest version? Because it's uh, I think it's very challenging. It's not so hard. <laughs> if you automate it. <laughs> yeah. Very hard, yeah. Yeah, but mostly on the infrastructure side, I would say. So it's yeah, the, the APIs don't change so often the, um, in, in terms of what the interface we interact with remains quite steady over the versions we've seen in Kubeflow. It depends, of course. But again, as I said, we have these version um windows that we support officially and then we because we're open source completely uh, i don't know if i mentioned that we we do rely on people using these to to update them and report us and we have extensive testing and you can talk michael all about that he's <laughs> he's dealing with kubeflow every day <laughs> yeah but, but it's pretty it's pretty it's it's pretty uh yeah it's hard it's challenging but it's required for us to maintain um, a reasonable sense of maturity within our community, and the community complains if there's something really broken. Okay, yes, good. So the question is, what is the overhead of using XenML? So like XenML comes with a server uh, and a dashboard, um, and this is one service that you need to maintain. And uh, it uh, it is backed by a database, and we have a cloud version coming. So if you, if you don't want to manage that, we can do that for you. Okay. Or maybe on Genesis Cloud someday. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah, so okay. I'm going to have a question for the great uh, uh, I think you showed the, you know, the very well and how easy it is to switch to a stack and then actually deploy the pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, however, I wanted to ask, you know, uh, how easy it is to actually set up as a stack, you know, in the first place. Because that actually when most of these uh, integrations are happening, mm -hmm. you know, and also how, for example, you know, um, how, how, how easy it is, you know, to, to actually update this type of stack, where you have one component that actually needs an upgrade and so on. Mm -hmm. So would you be able to share? Yeah. Yeah, so we have, um, so, so we have thought about that a lot because if you look at the complexity we're dealing with, it's really two layers. So uh, the layer you're talking about is the infrastructure layer, which is a beast in its own right. And and uh, then there's the integration layer on the application layer, uh, which is sort of what we is, we're focusing on, where we think also, is also there's a lot of complexity in terms of managing data and so forth. Uh, we We provide... I would say basic support for infrastructure in the sense that we have stack recipes. These stack recipes are uh, like Terraform modules that we have we are maintaining that let you deploy popular stacks. If you want to deploy Kubeflow with ML Flow with Selden, you just need to do XenML stack recipe deploy from our CLI, and it actually deploys it on any cloud uh, for you. And it also lets you update these components. However, we do understand that uh, like if you're in a big company, uh, it's a, it's a it's not going to be so easy as to do like what like what Sadiq and I showed you today, which is just help install and works. Um, so I mean, there are teams I'm sure you hired for that. <laughs> we can't really solve those problems, but uh, I think if you at least we give some guidance on how this infrastructure should be set up, and we make an opinion 
on how these things are connected. So we have found that many infrastructure teams also come to us and talk about design patterns and, and we figure that out. And we also talk about that on our blog and, and so forth. It is challenging though. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, then we have pizza and beer. 